Today I'm going to finish talking about um, humoral aspects of innate immune responses, specifically complement, and then we'll move into the next aspect of innate immune responses. And like I said, I my tech might be doing fun things today. And if it is, I'm so excited. All right. So this is the view from your textbook of um, complement. We've got three different ways complement can be started or initiated. They all come together at this sort of central part of the process. And then we have three different ways that we can have an effect on the pathogen, the effector function. Last time we talked about the classical pathway of initiation. And we saw one of the different types of effector function. And I drew on the board kind of the amount of this we had talked about on Friday. So you can see the classical pathway was initiated by antibody. Then um, we had C1 binding to that antibody, which activated C4, which activated C2, which activated C3. Um, all of the, the Cs, like C4 and C2 and C3, are getting cleaved into two pieces, an A and a B. Um, we're actually going to care about the two of them for C3, so that's why I actually drew those. I didn't draw the other ones because we don't care. Um, so you can see we've got C3A and C3B. C3B helps activate C5. Again, it gets cleaved into C5A and C5B, and we care. <laughs> so I drew them both. And C5B leads us to um, our first uh, way of destroying the pathogen, which was with the membrane attack complex, uh, C6 or C9. And generally, this middle part with C3 and CA is sort of the place where all of them are going to converge. So that's, that's this middle green box here. Um, the membrane attack complex is one of the things that can happen downstream, the perforation of cell membranes that your textbook says. Classical pathway is one of the pathways that we uh, talked about for initiation. Yep, Josh. Um. So yeah. So C5B is actually can be in C5B can be involved in all three of them. Though I would say it's most famously involved in membrane attack. Okay. Um, and I'm actually, my next step is to tell you about these other three ways of destroying the pathogen. So that's exactly where we're going. Um, so here you can see that membrane attack complex that we left off with last time. We've got C5B working together with C6, 7, 8, and a whole bunch of copies of 9 to make a pore in the hole or in the, the membrane. So a hole in the membrane you can see both a bunch of membrane um, pores at the t uh, sort of on a top view. You can see a side view with a membrane attack complex tube in a cell right there. And you can see the final result is osmotic lysis of bacteria. One thing that I also just want to point out here, it's going to be something we care more about later, but this figure shows it nicely, so I'm going to just point it out now. Um, you can see this um, surface of the microbe in this electron microscopy figure has a lot of holes in it, a lot of membrane attack complexes. It is possible that that could have started from one antibody binding. Because one antibody binding might allow a couple of C1s to get activated. And each C1 might allow a few C4s. And each C4 might allow a few C2s. And then we might get a few C3s. And so know that this is also not always one to one, that there can be amplification at each step. And so you can get a pretty big effect from even a small starting point. Um, the second way that we can deal with these microbes includes two of the fragments that I put on the board specially today. It's like I knew they were coming. Um, that's the small fragment of C3 called C3A. 
and the small fragment of C5 called C5A. Those are like these little pieces that get cut off and sort of float away. <laughs> but it turns out when those little pieces float away, there's a receptor that can bind them and signal to innate immune cells. So we can have those molecules, C3A and C5A, signal to innate immune cells and activate them, leading to an inflammatory response. Um, and you can see, for example, a change in blood vessel permeability. Um, you can see cells coming in and being recruited. You can see other proteins coming into the area. We're actually going to talk much more about inflammation a little bit later today because inflammation is part of the cellular innate immune response. So C3A and C5A can turn on the cellular innate immune response or turn on inflammation. So again, this is one place where some of the things that we're talking about here come together. So I can take C3A and C5A, and they're going to lead to inflammation. And that's the second way that we're going to deal with pathogens here. And so to address your question, in this case, C5B is not super important. It's really C5A and C3A. The final way that we can um, deal with microbes um, as a result of activating complement is one that I think I've snickered when I discussed every time since I first learned it as an undergraduate. Um, so I guess it's sort of become my favorite. Um, it's one called opsonization. Opsonization is a word that immunologists like to use. And we're going to see opsonization again later on in the semester in some other places. Um, the key part of opsonization is that you get stuff stuck to the microbe. And so here you can see C3B is stuck to this bacteria. And like that's just how complement works. Like, yeah, sure, sounds good. I told you before, we were sticking proteins onto things. So someone, some might say that in this figure, C3B has opsonized this bacteria. Um, to address your question from before, Josh, C3B is the most famous one here, but C5B can also act here. Um, but what happens with opsonization is really key. And the reason why I always laugh about opsonization is that uh, my professor in my uh, immunology class taught us an analogy about opsonization. And when I got to the first exam, we were asked to define opsonization. And I couldn't remember the definition, but I could remember the analogy. And so I wrote the analogy and got it wrong. Um, so I'm going to tell you the same analogy, because I think it really works. But don't write it on the exam. <laughs> um, so opsonization means coating a microbe with something, or putting some, attaching something to a microbe, in order to make that microbe more likely to get phagocytosed. So we've enhanced the likelihood of this microbe getting phagocytosed because we have attached this molecule C3B onto it. And so what my professor told me back in the day was that opsonization is like butter. It's a coating that some, goes on something to make it look more tasty and more likely to get eaten. And so my definition of opsonization was butter, um, which they didn't really like for some the way that this specifically works is that we have cells that can do phagocytosis, and those cells have complement receptors on their surface. So if our microbe is coated with complement, that complement can bind to um, a, the, the complement receptor, and now our phagocytic cell will phagocytose that microbe. And so complement getting coated onto a microbe will make that microbe 
more likely to get phagocytosed. Uh, I'm going to draw this arrow from C3B here. It could be from C5B. It could be from a few different things. So we can also, again, here we're taking some of those proteins of the innate immune system and making them interact with the cells. Um, and um, coat things with complement in order to increase the ability of those things to be phagocytose. This process of opsonization relies on complement receptors on cells. There are, in reality, a lot of types of complement receptors. They bind to different complement fragments. So just like we were, I was saying before, it could be C3B, it could be C5B, it could be a lot of different things. The reason why I point this out is that one other thing that comes up in this table is that some of those complement receptors are found on some of our adaptive immune cells, like B cells and T cells. And so you can notice A bunch of places where we have adaptive immune cells with complement receptors. And so having complements on a microbe can also sort of enhance adaptive immune responses. So I guess we'll call that one number 3.5 or something. Um, because we can also enhance adaptive immune responses. This is also going through complement receptors, binding to um, complement fragments that may be on a microbe. So those are the ways that we get rid of microbes using the complement cascade. And you've seen one way that we can turn on the complement cascade, the classical pathway. This was the first pathway that scientists described. Though, as you can see from your textbook, we now know it's actually probably the last one to be activated. Um, it also is definitely the last one to have evolved. Um, and you can see this here. The classical pathway is only present in some organisms like mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, while some of these other initiation pathways are present much further back in the phylogenetic tree. But I find if you understand the classical pathway, understanding the other ones is easier. So one of the issues, or one of the key points about the classical pathway is that it starts with an antibody binding to the microbe surface. And an antibody is part of the adaptive immune response. So in order to get the classical pathway to start, you need to have antibodies around. The good thing about these other two initiation pathways is that they don't require antibodies. So they don't require you to have made an adaptive immune response yet. And they also can happen in organisms who don't have adaptive immunity. Um, one of these two initiation pathways is sometimes known as, is known as the lectin pathway. sometimes also referred to as the MBL pathway. Lectin is a biochemical term. Lectin as a biochemical term means a protein that binds to a carbohydrate. That's all it means. It's not that fancy. It's just it's a protein that binds to a sugar. And the lectin pathway starts with oh my gosh, hold on to your seats, a protein that binds to a sugar, a lectin. Specifically, the sugar in this case is a sugar called mannose. And many microbes have a lot of mannose as a part of their cell wall. So you can see the little red uh, hexagons as mannose all over this microbe. And the lectin, 
that binds to mannose here is called mannose binding lectin, <laughs> or MBL. So this starts with MBL, mannose binding lectin, binding to the mannose that's just already present on the surface of the microbe. So we didn't have to do anything fancy to get it ready to, to go. The microbe already had the mannose. MBL is able to bind. Um, and if, again, I mentioned before, immunologists love um, acronyms. So I might I will call this MBL. You just remember in your mind what MBL stands for. You pretty much are good in terms of knowing what's going on. You can see an image of MBL in on this slide. Um, you can see, for example, it in green. Um, it's in green both on both sides of this slide. If you look at mannose binding lectin or MBL. What do you notice about it? Yeah, Emma. It looks like C1. We saw C1 in the classical pathway. It looks like an upside down bouquet of flowers. And MBL looks pretty similar. And in fact, structurally, MBL is incredibly similar to C1. Once MBL has bound to the mannose, on the surface of a microbe, it undergoes a conformational change and can activate another protein, just like we saw with all the other parts of the complement cascade. What did C1's conformational change activate? Yeah, Josh. C4, right? If you were, if you were hoping, because you wanted easiness and things to, to memorize. What would you hope MBL's conformational change led to? A change in. What would make your life the easiest? What do you think, Emma? C4. That would be like make your life way easy, right? Um, you win. <laughs> so MBL activates C4. <laughs> And from there, it's identical to the classical pathway. So we've got, it's the same C4. The same C4 is turning on C2. The same C2 is turning on C3. Same C3 is turning on C. It's all identical to what you just already saw with the classical pathway. Like I said, that's why I tell you the classical pathway first. Um, so that one's pretty straightforward. Then we have the third way of turning on the complement cascade. And the third initiation pathway is the problem child. It is the one that whenever I explain it to students the first time, they're just like, no, 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 that does not happen, no. I promise it does. And we can think about why it is this crazy thing has to happen. Um, so like I said, this final pathway is the alternative pathway. And in order to tell you about exactly what's happening with the alternative pathway, um, I have to tell you a little bit of, teensy tiny bit of biochemistry. So this is your textbook's view of the C3 protein. And what you should know about the C3 protein is that at one point in this protein, there is this bond between with this sulfur and with this uh, C double bonded to an O. This is called a thioester. There's this thioester bond in C3. And the thioester is in a really strained conformation. It's like bent in a super weird way. And so this, this is not as obvious to you guys as a, you're a bit younger than my old self. 
But if I had to spend some, a lot of my day bent in a really weird configuration, what would eventually potentially happen to me? What? Maybe, or what, what would more likely happen? Imagine I'm old. I would break. <laughs> I'd probably break, right? Like, at some point, I'm in this, like, super weird configuration, and I can't hold it forever, and I'm going to break. <laughs> C3 has this really weird thioester in it. And sometimes, C3 just breaks. <laughs> And when C3 breaks, it basically breaks into C3A and C3B. Um, so it, the idea here is that C3 can spontaneously activate. Um, sometimes it is known as the tickover of complement, the spontaneous tickover of complement. I'll have that on the next slide. And so sometimes there's this random C3 floating around. Normally it was attached to something. Now it's floating around because it just broke, like in your blood. There are two things that can happen after it breaks. And this is particularly related to kind of what happens with this uh, C with a double bond, O, oh, so the carboxyl. One thing that can happen is that this carboxyl could fr the first thing it could encounter is water. First thing it just happens to run into in your body is water. If it runs into water, you get the product that's shown here at the top. And that just makes a piece of C3 bead that floats around your body. And frankly, we're never going to care about that ever again. But it's also possible that the first molecule that that C3 could come in contact with has either an ROH, an R group with an OH, or an R group with an NH2 on it. If that happens, then the C3B reacts with that ROH or RNH2 and gets bound to that surface. So let's think about this. I said this could happen if this C3 molecule encounters ROH or RNH2. Can you think of anything in your body that might have ROH or RNH2? Any biomolecules, think of R as like carbon-containing molecule with an OH or a carbon-containing molecule with an NH2. Can you think of anything that has that in your body? Yeah, Michaela. OK, so every amino acid, so every protein. Anything else? What, what about DNA? What about lipids? What about every biomolecule you learned about in Bio250? <laughs> they all have that. So basically, if this C3B happens to first run into water, we don't care. But if it happens to run into literally any biological molecule, it's going to react with it and attach. And in the case that's shown in this image, oh my gosh, that ROH was on a microbe surface. So we attached to the microbe. Ta-da! We didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to even recognize it was a microbe. We just attached. Spontaneously. No effort. And you can see this exact same thing happening here. This is just the same process viewed from another textbook, so you have a different perspective. You can see that C3 sometimes spontaneously cleaves. It's sometimes known as the spontaneous takeover <laughs> of complement. Um, it can be uh, inactivated by interacting with water, or it can covalently bind to some surface, which in a perfect, happy world, is a microbe surface, <laughs> like you see here. And on the bottom, you're seeing basically, again, the same thing, but you're actually seeing sort of the chemistry of it here. Um, and that's because I know people have different amounts of chemistry and different kind of backgrounds in terms of how this is going to make sense to them. Um, so sometimes C3 
just spontaneously breaks. I'll put C3B and C3A like this. It just spontaneously breaks. Right now, in your body, complement is spontaneously ticking over. Um, you will know, I, I mention this kind of frequently. Sometimes that I'm like, right now, while you're sitting here, this is happening to you. Um, my poor mother, my poor mother has two daughters with PhDs in immunology. I'm just, that's, it's just my sister and I. And she'll be like, what are you doing? You're not doing anything. Get off the couch. And we'll be like, mom, we're spontaneously taking over a compliment. What are you talking about? Um, and you will see throughout the semester my whole list of things I tell her that I'm doing. Um, so uh, my poor mother. But anyway, um, so this is happening to you right now. When that C3 spontaneously breaks, it can interact with some other proteins. I'm not going to get super in-depth with the details of exactly what's going on here. I'm just going to tell you the names of those proteins and kind of like put them in a box by alternative pathway. Knowing the order and exactly what each one is doing is not super important for us. But some of those proteins are going to are known as factor B, factor D, both of which are shown here. You can see they're like big parts and little parts, and they get funny names. And if I was really telling you all the names of all the things here, at one point in time, I would have to tell you about something called C3BBBB um, and stuff like that. And it's just like craziness. Um, but you can see we've got. Factor B, we've got factor D, and we've got this other one called preparatin. And these proteins interact with C3B whenever it's on the surface of something. And when I, you get all of these proteins together, they can cleave C3. So now, you cleave more C3. <laughs> so, so broken C3 makes more C3. It's like a positive feedback kind of thing. And we end up getting a ton of C3B on the surface of that microbe. It turns out, really, these proteins could bind to the C3B that was produced in any way. And so the alternative pathway dramatically amplifies all of the uh, pathways here. So not only can it sort of just start randomly on a microbe, these proteins also serve to make way more copies <laughs> of the C3B here that came from either the classical or lectin pathway and dramatically amplify this process. And so here you can see what I mentioned before. We might have, say, one C1 binding, but we can get you know, multiple C4s. We can then get multiple C2s. And then by the time we get to C3, we are just making tons and tons and tons of C3B to get all over that microbe to make all of those uh, holes that we saw in the surface of the microbe. So this is kind of the basic idea of um, the alternative pathway. And the thing that's awesome about the alternative pathway is that the alternative pathway is, hap is sort of spontaneous. It is happening all the time, right away. If there is a microbe that gets into your body, it can get attacked by the C3B from an alternative pathway. It at like time equals one second. <laughs> it's just, it's happening all the time. And so remember we talked about those numbers problems for dealing with different microbes? Well, here you're starting to potentially membrane attack as soon as the microbe gets in because you've got C3B all, all through your body. Some fraction of it's always breaking. You're always able to put it onto a microbe. You don't even have to like have any kind of receptor, any kind of recognition. You don't have to do anything. It's just kind of this basic chemical process of we're going to get rid of C3. 
these cells. We're going to just keep depositing C3B on the cells and get rid of them. So it's awesome because it's so fast and can really help you drive down the numbers of microbes. However, the alternative pathway also has a big problem. And sometimes people will notice this when they first hear about the alternative pathway. Sometimes they, sometimes they, they figure it out themselves. Sometimes they need me to tell them. Um, but the moral of the story is it's a big freaking problem with the alternative pathway. What's the problem with the alternative pathway as I've described it? You guys envision what this problem might be? Yeah, Grace. Yeah, it involves C3B reacting with any biological molecule it happens to go in contact with. So yeah, it's, if it happens to come in contact with a microbe first, it's going to react with that microbe surface. If it happens to come in contact with, I don't know, one of the cells of your heart, it's going to attach to one of the cells of your heart or the cells of your skin or any of your other cells. You are constantly, right now, having C3B attaching to your cells because it's simply this biochemical interaction between the uh, carboxyl on C3B and um, ROH or RNH2 on your body. So all your cells right now, as you sit here, are getting attacked by C3B. This seems bad, <laughs> right? You're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Am I going to lice at any moment? But clearly, you have not lysed. Clearly, there's a way that you don't die <laughs> from this. And the way that this actually works is that all of your cells contain complement inhibitors. So all of your cells have complement inhibitors on their surface. There are tons of different complement inhibitors, just like there are tons of different complement proteins. So you can see some of them here that might bind to C3B and stop its action. There's one that's actually in the surface of your cell that just keeps breaking apart C3s <laughs> if they're on the surface of your cell. Basically, every single step that I show you here has an inhibitor, and your cells have all the inhibitors. So all day long, you have C3B attaching to your cells, and your cells are just constantly getting rid of it and shuffling it off. Um, what you can notice here, um, you will notice this so much more in a later discussion, but it does come up here a little bit. One thing the immune system is not is super efficient. <laughs> Basically, we're making a whole bunch of protein that we're then going to throw away. And we're, you're going to see many examples of, first we make this, and then we throw it away. And you're going to be like, this is so wasteful. Actually, not wasteful when you consider that it's helping you survive against a microbe who's really fast. If you didn't survive against a microbe who's really fast, you'd die, and that's even more wasteful. Um, so do not, so realize for the course of the semester, thinking about like things that should be, seem efficient aren't real things where you have to worry about. Selective pressure of microbes is actually so much more than the selective pressure for efficiency. Yep, Andrew. So, so they actually are inactivated and eventually just get degraded by, say, the liver or other parts of the body as, as inactive proteins that are useless. So um, they're not going to re-react. That's a great question. Um, once that C3B, um, or whatever complement protein has been inactivated, it's just going to get degraded um, and kind of recycled for its amino acids. Um, yeah, so here's just another example of some complement inhibitors. Um, there's one that actually is on your cells that gets in the middle of any membrane attack complex that tries to form. Um, so you can never have membrane attack complexes on your cells. Um, this actually is something that has become really interesting um, in a lot of ways in the field. Um, you know, the idea is that we have all these complement inhibitors on our cells, inhibiting complement, yay, and microbes don't, and so microbes get killed and our cells don't. 
we've actually learned that, um, I mentioned to you guys last time that complement seems to be super important in osteoarthritis, the type of arthritis you get as you age, as well as a bunch of other diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Osteoarthritis is a disease of the joints, bones, right, where two bones come together. Turns out the outside of your bones aren't made of cells, which means they don't have complement inhibitors. And so complement can just keep reacting with your bone <laughs> and keep getting into that joint surface and potentially causing damage at that bone site, potentially leading to arthritis. And so we're actually realizing, like, oh, wait. Maybe if we actually think about anatomy and physiology for a second, like, we can imagine places where this might be a problem. Um, and we're starting to actually learn a lot more about complement. Um, it has been shown to have roles in things from synapse pruning um, to, um, like, if you can think of it, I've seen complement papers, and I'm like, really? Um, so it's pretty cool. But sometimes we have a pathogen invade. We have those preformed proteins try to attack the pathogen. And sometimes they win. The pathogen is eliminated. And you live happily ever after. Sometimes the pathogen is not eliminated. And now we need to actually have the next level of immunity start to work. Um, and so now we're going to still be in the innate immune response, but now we're going to see the cells starting to do something instead of just proteins. These cells don't usually start acting until about four hours. Um, and that's partially because the cells need to do things like get activated, maybe do some transcription and translation, maybe move to the right location of the body, um, things like that. Um, and these cells are going to really be dominating the response for about the first four days. Sometimes I think about the first 96 hours. So those cells are going to kind of start to get activated. They're going to start to do something. And hopefully they're going to get rid of the pathogen and have us leave happily ever after. Though we do have some more stuff for later in the semester that's covered up here with the white box. Um, this process that is happening with the innate immune cells is very broadly talked about as inflammation. Um, inflammation can happen in response to infection. It can also happen in response to tissue injury, tissue stress. Um, we may talk a little bit about that. We may not. There's sort of a question that comes up every so often uh, that we can get into. Um, and inflammation has an important physiological purpose, um, both to help with defense and to help with tissue repair and returning you to homeostasis. If you sit around and watch TV while your complement is doing its thing, um, then you might hear about all the ways that you need to get rid of inflammation. And you might hear about how inflammation is just the worst thing ever, and you just definitely want to get rid of it. Um, that's what a lot of, especially cosmetic products, are all about, getting rid of your inflammation, from health and wellness products. If you did not have any inflammation at all, it would be really, really, really bad. Because you couldn't defend yourself from infection or repair or damaged tissues or get back to homeostasis. Um, the problem is that sometimes inflammation can go on too long or be too much. And we'll see more of that uh, a little bit later. We're going to see the role of two important innate immune cells here. These two cells are the neutrophil and the macrophage, both of which I introduced to you previously as innate immune cells. Um, the neutrophil was a granulocyte. The macrophage was um, related to the monocyte. Um, both of them do phagocytosis and killing of microbes, but they are going to be doing it um, in slightly different parts of the process with slightly different results. Um, I point that out because students often like to confuse neutrophils and macrophages. Um, and so you want to pay close attention to what are the things going on with the neutrophil versus what are things going on with the macrophage here. Um, this is a figure from your textbook that actually goes through a lot of this process. There are some places where I love this figure and some places where this figure makes me really frustrated. Um, so note 
this is kind of the situation where things are healthy. This is what should be going on. Um, and they're showing you um, skin, you've got some tissue under the skin, and then eventually you've got a blood vessel, a capillary. For reasons that I've never understood in every immunology class I've ever taken in my life, when the professor wants to explain this, they're always like, and if I was talking to you and I banged my head re hand really hard on the podium and got a cut, this is what would happen. I, I don't know why we're banging our hands like that, but this would in fact be what was happening in my skin and in the, the tissue right under my skin going to the blood vessel if I banged my head, hand on the podium. I don't mind. Um, so I'd have a, a wound, you have a break in the skin, you would eventually have some bacteria coming in. Um, and so you can see that wound. Um, and um, you can see this is sort of generally, uh, those bacteria are generally at interacting with this cell. Notice that this cell that I'm showing here lived in the tissue before this whole business happened. So this cell was hanging out in the tissue, kind of ready to help with surveillance, ready to call in other cells before this happened. It just it normally lives there. Um, they call this cell an effector cell here. I am going to call this cell a macrophage. <laughs> Um, so we've got macrophages that live in tissues that are ready to go if a bacteria happens to be introduced. Um, you, if any of you have heard of um, Langerhans cells before, Langerhans cells are actually the technical name for macrophages in the blood or in the skin. Or you might have heard of Kuiper cells. They're macrophages in the liver. You might have heard of microglia. They're macrophages in the brain. Um, but they, the macrophages often live in a particular location. Um, and then we're, we see some results that will happen in this site because of the inflammation or, or because of the response of these macrophages. Um, you all know about inflammation. You've all experienced this in your life. And I point that out because you don't have to know a ton of immunology background to know the details of what's going on in this response. In fact, um, this response was first really well described by the Romans. Also did not have the Bio 250 prereq. Um, and they talked about the inflammatory response and said that it had, when, when inflammation happened, there were four signs. They talked about the four cardinal signs of inflammation. What are those four signs of inflammation? That ha what are the four things that happen when you have inflammation? Yep. Redness, swelling, heat. It's okay. Go for it. No, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Redness, heat, swelling. Yeah. Usually we say pain, but yeah. So we got redness, we got heat, we got swelling, we got pain. Or the Romans would have said ruber instead of redness, calor instead of heat, uh, dolor instead of pain, and tumor instead of swelling. <laughs> so, that, so that's what they called it. So all, of, all four of those things are actually happening because of what this macrophage does. And we're going to see those responses here. Um, so you can see, again, my effector cell is a macrophage in the tissue. I already told you that. Um, and the first thing that we have to be able to figure out in this situation is how in the world does that macrophage know that there were bacteria around? So to start this whole process, the macrophage has to be like, hey, look, there's bacteria. I should start this process. How might you imagine that a macrophage would do that? Just from kind of first principles of biology. What might be what's going on? Do macrophages have eyes? No. So how is this probably going to work? Yeah. There's got to be some kind of receptor that helps them detect microbes. Um, and that's what's going on here. We talk a lot in this uh, part of the discussion about something known as self-non-self -self recognition. The macrophage has a bunch of receptors 
that bind to things that your cells don't have, that are, all, that are characteristics of not self. So there are lots of different uh, molecules on our microbe that are not self molecules. They're unique to different microbes. And our macrophage will have receptors for those foreign things. Note that you can see on the right hand side here that one particular macrophage probably has a lot of these receptors. So it's not like each one macrophage has one kind of receptor. It has a ton of receptors to bind to all sorts of foreign stuff. These images show those receptors on the surface of the cell, but in reality, they, there are such receptors in a bunch of different places on the cell surface, but also in different compartments of the cell in the cytoplasm. It's just not drawn that way here. These receptors are known as PRRs, which stands, ah, which stands for pattern recognition receptors. Um, so these pattern recognition receptors are, oh my gosh, receptors, that's what the last R stands for. And these receptors are binding to something that is being found in many different microbes, something that's a pattern in different microbes. Um, you can see we've got many different types of PRRs um, on one uh, macrophage. And what you can notice is that different microbes can have the same patterns. So one receptor can actually detect many microbes by recognizing the thing that is different about those microbes. The things that the PRRs recognize, notice that the name is pattern recognition receptor. So again, if you're trying to make your life easy, you would hope that the thing the receptors recognize is a pattern. Um, is known as uh, a MAMP. This term has changed in the field over time, and so you may see the old version in some cases. In fact, the previous slide has the old version on it. MAMP stands for microbe associated molecular pattern. So it's the pattern, yay, <laughs> just like you had a pattern recognition receptor. And it's a pattern that is a molecule found only on microbes, not on our cells. These used to be called PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And then we realized that some of them were on microbes that weren't pathogens. And so um, we switched largely to using MAMPs. Some examples of MAMPs are shown on this slide. So you can see they include things like peptidoglycan. That is part of the prokaryotic cell wall, but is not found in our cells. They include things like LPS, found in the gram-negative cell wall, not found in our cells. They include flagellin, the thing that makes up the bacterial flagella. They include this um, fungal product called zymosan. Um, they include some um, products made by parasites. Um, they also include some different types of nucleic acid species. Um, and you can see that there are different um, receptors for different MAMPs. The great thing here is that if we have a macrophage with TLR4, TLR4 was like the first one that was really well described, a pretty famous one. It will recognize LPS. LPS is in the surface 
of gram-negative bacteria. That means TLR4 will recognize any gram-negative bacteria. So it recognizes E. coli and Salmonella and Shigella and Vibrio, which is the causative agent of cholera, and Yersinia, which is the causative agent of plague, and on and on and on and on and on and on. So we got one receptor that's recognizing a whole lot of microbes simply by being able to recognize a molecular piece that the microbes have that we don't. The other thing that's really nice about this, particularly in comparison to adaptive immune responses, is it's really hard for microbes to mutate many of these products. If a microbe is going to try to get around some um, of our adaptive immune responses, they might only have to change like one amino acid just to be a little tiny bit different, and suddenly the adaptive immune response can't see them. Honestly, LPS has evolved over like, I don't know, four billion years. The microbe cannot easily change the structure of LPS and have it work. Basically, if it's got LPS, it can't change it. Um, more you know, famously, like, here's one that responds to certain types of DNA. Oh, really? What's the bacteria going to do? Change the entire structure of DNA that all life depends on? No, it can't. So these are broad things that the microbe can't really change. They're going to and hit a lot of microbes um, really well with these PRRs. Um, once the PRR binds to a microbial pattern, um, a few different things will happen. So there are really, when we're talking about PRRs and macrophages, there are going to be two big actions that are going to happen. This is one of them. You'll see both of them together on the next slide. One of the things that will happen is that that microbe will get phagocytosed. This is, of course, only possible if the receptor is on the surface of the cell. The things inside the cell, we're not going to phagocytose further. Um, and now we're going to be able to degrade that microbe by phagocytosis. So when we do phagocytosis, um, the membrane of the cell is going to sort of get pulled in in like a little bubble, and we're going to make a new organelle, a new compartment that wasn't there before. Because we made this organelle by phagocytosis, you know what we call it? We call it the phagosome. So we make a phagosome. That phagosome eventually fuses with the lysosome, and we completely degrade the microbe. Yay, we win. Because this is a macrophage, doing um, this response downstream of a pattern recognition receptor, we also can have a second thing happen. So you can see phagocytosis and de degradation of the microbe on the left. Our microbe will also bind to that pattern recognition receptor and induce some signal transduction. So we're going to have signal transduction happening in this macrophage. And as a result, the macrophage will now transcribe different genes, genes that it was not transcribing before. Those, once those genes are transcribed, we've got mRNA. Once we've got the mRNA, we can do translation and make the protein. Look, there's a the protein, these little fun triangles. And those proteins can then be secreted from the cell. Um, and so we're going to be able to make these new proteins and secrete them to act on other cells. You will see that these proteins that are listed here are called cytokines. And we're going to see cytokines a lot this semester. 
cytokine is a word that immunologists use to talk about a protein that one cell sends out to give to a message to another. It's ba they're basically the messenger proteins of the immune system. In some ways, you can think of them as being like hormones, though hormones aren't always protein. So cytokines are kind of the immunology's messenger molecule. So basically, this cell is recognizing this microbe, making a message by transcription, then translating that message and secreting it from the cell, sending it out into the world to tell its friends, hey, guys, there's something bad around. Maybe be active and change your response. <laughs> we are going to see tons of cytokines over the course of this semester. The cytokines that are made here in the case of inflammation are generally called inflammatory cytokines, because they're the inf inflammation kind of cytokines. Um, sometimes people see this and they think inflammatory cytokines are like all cytokines or something. And that's not true. They're ones that don't do inflammation. Um, it's just that in this situation, the inflammatory cytokines are made. Um, you can see um, sort of this listed here as well. So we've got our pattern recognition receptor at the top binding to our microbe. And we are and doing some signaling, which right now is depicted as an arrow. Um, we'll see it in somewhat more detail on uh, next week or Friday or I don't know what day the week is. The next time we meet, um, and you can see that one of the things that will happen is that we'll get killing of microbes due to phagocytosis, and another thing that we'll get is inflammation and um, adaptive immune response. There's one other kind of small thing. I say small, it's probably not small. It's a thing that immunologists are learning a lot more about um, right now. It's something the field, it's something that I learned during COVID. And it's something that the field in general is kind of figuring out more about, even though I've shown this slide for years. There is also some other, there are also some other effects going on, like with tissue remodeling, things like wound healing are happening. Immunologists in the past have not always thought a lot about wound healing. We're like, that's not ours. That's like the anatomy and physiology of people's problem. That's not our problem. Um, but it turns out that actually like healing the wound that the bacteria came into is kind of important. And it's happening directly as a result of many of these proteins. When some people learn about complements for the first time, They say, that reminds me of something. Because there's one thing that people sometimes have learned about before that has some similarities to complement. So did you guys note that complement reminded you of anything that you might have learned about, particularly in like an A and P kind of class? Sometimes people look at complement and they say, that kind of sounds like that blood clotting stuff I had to memorize one time. All the blood clot, one protein leads to the other protein, and then it's they, They're like, man, it reminds me of blood clotting. Well, you know, we, we, this is kind of how I learned innate immunity. You have the microbe, it turns on complement, it turns on innate immune cells. We get our cytokines and some other molecules that are involved in inflammation. Ta-da! Um, sometimes, if there's too much, too long, or inappropriate amounts of those cytokines, we have problems. But what we've really learned in the past couple of years is that the coagulation system is closely interlinked with what's going on with complement and what's going on with um, innate immune cells. Um, I actually learned that one of the proteins I study in my lab, um, if you remove it from innate immune cells, they don't make clots anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I didn't know I studied that. Um, and so, it so there does seem to be a lot of linkage, close interlinkage um, between some of these systems. Um, I say this because we've learned with some infectious diseases, and COVID was one of the big ones here, that some patients have a bunch of clotting disorders. Um, when they have really severe responses. And that actually may be because of having too much of these cytokines. 
and too much innate immune responses. And so like I said, this is sort of an area that we're suddenly like, oh wait, maybe we should study this um, more and more in the field. So what we've seen so far is that our inflammatory cytokines get made. So you can see our macrophage has sensed our microbe using a PRR. And as a result, that, mic that macrophage has made some inflammatory cytokines. Now, our inflammatory cytokines have to do something. And we're going to see what those inflammatory cytokines do. You will also notice that this, the title of this slide mentions both cytokines and chemokines. Chemokines are really just a type of cytokine. They are chemotactic cytokines, or cytokines that tell other cells to move. So cytokines, in general, can send any kind of signal. Chemokines are specifically saying a, giving like a come here or go there kind of signal. So sometimes you will see um, this listed as chemokines and cytokines. Sometimes it'll be listed as one or the other. And we can see a bunch of different chemokines and cytokines that are made at this point, each of which have different types of effects. I am going to specifically mention TNF-alpha and IL-6 by name. Um, so I'm just circling their names here, though I don't necessarily care that you know like which thing TNF does that other ones don't. Like these are the functions, but if I reference say TNF alpha or IL-6, I mean for you to know I mean an inflammatory cytokine. Um, and these inflammatory cytokines in general do things like influence blood vessels to change their permeability. Also, they influence metabolism. Um, that both helps with defense and that um, can raise the temperature in the infected tissue which is bad for the bacteria. The bacteria can't handle it being hot. And it actually makes your, some of your cells work better. We can do things like signal to the bone marrow and say, hey, bone marrow, give me more neutrophils. And we can also move some of these other cells to this location, as well as further turning on the adaptive immune response. The view, this picture from your textbook, shows one of the really specific things that we see happening with the inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Here you can see my little, my surface, my wound that I got from banging my hand on the podium. This is kind of what it looked like to start. Here's my cytokines being made. One of the things that happens is the blood vessel nearby changes in diameter. So you can see the change in diameter of the blood vessel. That's vasodilation. We've increased the size of that blood vessel. You can also see that the cells of the walls of the blood vessel get farther apart. The blood vessel gets leaky. This is referred to as enhanced vascular permeability. Why do you think that we make the blood vessel bigger and make the blood vessel leaky? Yeah, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. So we got to be able to let more cells in. We got to get more cells there. Yeah, what were you going to say? Let's neutrophils pass through. You know what else it lets pass through? Complement proteins and some of those other antimicrobial peptides. So you get fluid, you get protein, you get cells, you get all sorts of stuff in there. In fact, you're bringing in so much stuff, it's probably going to get like crowded and maybe start swelling. Oh my gosh, that was one of our four cardinal signs, all coming from those cytokines. Also, because you're getting all that blood influx, it's going to get red. Oh my gosh, it's another one of our cardinal signs. And because the blood coming, is coming straight out of the vessels warm, it's going to get hot. In addition, there are some metabolic changes that warm the area as well. Oh my gosh, it's one of those cardinal signs. And the cytokines also act on nerves and give you pain. But I'm not going to say much more about that. Um, so 
we're going to continue looking at what these inflammatory cytokines um, do um, on Friday. And I will see you guys then.